Poho Iki. Right now, that's a hard thing to talk about. Recently, we had a lava flow that covered a place that was very special to many of us Hawaiians and local people who live in our area, which is the Puna district. Um, even right now, I'm just having a difficult time talking about it. You know, in the Puna district, you know, the Pele has always been active here and it took Kalapana. So that left Pohoiki, you know, one of the last places or surfing spots in the Puna district. You know, most of the people who live in our district live off the land. You know, they want to practice, you know, our traditional things of hunting and fishing and, you know, gathering, you know, living, you know, somewhat, you know, the Hawaiian practice, you know, we try and keep that alive here. Because we don't have a lot of, you know, city things or town things or shopping centers and things like that, you know, there's um, not very much things to do. Pohoiki was, was that thing. You know, it was part of our recreation, which is a huge part for us to release whatever's on our mind exercise and just to be happy and to be with family for me growing up in this area you know poiki was a place that i learned how to bodyboard you know there's a lot of special moments that came out of that place you know and a lot of memories that i can just <laughs> kind of think about you know of that place even going down the old mango tree road when it was red road and, you know, sitting on a flatbed truck with my Uncle Fisherman, you know, Uncle Megan, and my family friends, you know, we grew up with each other, hanging on to the flatbed truck, you know, by a small rope, all the way down to Pohoiki, on the highway, all the way straight down to the beach. And I can remember that, you know, when we were eight, nine years old behind the truck, you know, I'm just happy I grew up at that place. I'm happy that I can just remember us surfing at bowls, surfing at shacks, you know, when the waves would get so big or so stormy and we'll be really out deep in the deep blues and it was spooky, you know, when waves that big or you think you've seen a shark and, <laughs> um, or you get sucked out or you get pushed over to a different bay. It was an awesome you know, just to think about it, it just it was awesome. And growing up in the harbor, and and I remember swimming under the pier, and you know, just jumping off the brick wall, and a whole bunch of stuff. Seeing my friends, you know, seeing my family fishing on the on the reef, seeing my uncle coming in from his boat from his long day, you know, from fishing or catching a ama crab. The aunties and the uncles selling lao lao, selling whatever foods that, you know, that you could eat. And when there was no vendors and it's the weekday, then all you had to eat was, I remember the old papaya field that we used to eat papayas and you'd have to eat mangoes from the road or we'd eat guavas of whatever we could find. You know, those were the times that... <laughs> We used to do or inu with our friends, you know, after school or, you know, whenever we power work or weekends. It was a fun time, you know, going in the ocean and just releasing all the heva, all the badness. You know, in the Hawaiian custom, it, it's called hiuvai. Hiuvai was like a cleansing, yeah. Pohi was like a, a refuge for us as Hawaiians a place that we can go. You had bows, you had shacks, dead trees, and you also had first bay and second bay to third bay. And Poiki was always active. You know, it's rarely that Poiki would be flat because either one of the bays or on whichever side would at least have surf. But it was a place that we could go to. And if there was something bothering us, we could go there and get it all out in the ocean. And most times the ocean would win. So it kind of puts us back in place. It makes us appreciate life, whether the ocean's going to hold you down and you get pounded or pounded on the reef or whatever. It makes you really appreciate what we got. It was an awesome place. 
no matter what time or what day you go down there, you're going to see somebody that you know. And everybody respected each other, especially if you grew up with the people and you know the families. And over time, you do. Everybody knows each other. Another thing that made Pohoiki special was Uncle Hale, you know. Uh, he put that place on the map, his house. You know, it's the only red house at the ending of that road. I, I remember Uncle Hale. I always just remember him smiling and waving at everybody. You know, my brothers, you know, slept in that house. Everybody pretty much, you know, uh, went to Uncle Hale's and, and slept there or camped on his front lawn. And, you know, he made sure to welcome everybody, no matter who you are, tourist, visitor, whatever. If you had no place to go, you could go to Uncle Hale's house and he would take you in. He would feed you. Um, a lot of the fishermen would give him fish and he was a fisherman himself you know he welcomed I mean this guy had a huge heart and he was this big Hawaiian man but his heart was aloha for a lot of the kids who had nowhere to go you know he accepted them and he brought them in and always made everyone who go through his yard feel welcome you know, there was no fence, no barrier. You know, everybody was welcome in the front of his yard, to the back of his yard, to inside of his house. <laughs> you know, that was the Hawaiian style. You know, it was no scared of, oh, you can take this or whatever. It was just he wanted to um, malama everybody and take care of everybody. You know, before Uncle Hale passed away, I visited him at his home and he was living you know, in Kiao, and I talked to him. You know, this man was aloha. You know, he wasn't a rich man, but what he what what he was rich was his heart. You know, he knew how to show aloha, and that's the reason why he's so well known today. You know, and I documented that place. You know, not knowing that the lava flow would ever take it, and when the lava flow was actually just going through Puna, that was. Um, extremely traumatizing for a lot of the families that live in that area. And a lot of the homes got destroyed. And, you know, it's not only homes, it's memories. A lot of development started to occur and a lot of things were put into the planning department to develop that site. And I'm kind of glad that, you know, the volcano came down and just kind of cleaned everything out because... It stopped a lot of things that was going to happen that may have been more hurt to the community than what has happened um, now. Um, there's nothing that we can blame to say, oh, you know, the volcano came down and wiped it out. You know, it, it was a good thing. You know, we got to look at it as that, you know, and sometimes um, that's just the way things are. Um, and it happens for reasons. You know, the development that was going to be happening in Puna or near Pohoiki, uh, that would have been more hurtful for us as Hawaiians to see that go up and to be fighting amongst each other. And in a way, maybe that stopped that division of our community from happening. This is just my feeling about it. You know, living on Oahu and coming back home uh, to Hawaii Island, I've been here for a couple months now, and I couldn't go down to Poiki. You know, I just couldn't. If you hear people from Kalapana explain Kaimu, or if you can hear of people explain Kalapana, like how it was such a beautiful place because they were raised there and they, they know how it affected them. And same with Poiki, it was a refuge. And the difference is, is, is because. Kalapana had um, the Black Sand Beach and they had Pooiki. You know, there was more options of beaches, you know. But once Kalapana got taken away, our only option was Pooiki. So whether you liked it or not, you had to learn to love that beach. You had to learn to surf that beach. You know, the beaches became more limited. You're talking about Puna is the size of Oahu. And we only have one beach. 
you know, and everybody, because that was all we had, we, we took care of that place. Who comes to that beach? Who leaves that beach? You desecrate that beach, you're going to get what you desecrated it for. And I've seen it many times happen. And if you don't learn and you come in with this holy mentality of you're going to think you're going to do whatever, you know, you're going, you're going to think again when you go to that beach and you're going to be and you're going to learn real quick of how you're going to act when you get to that beach. And that's the reputation of Pohoiki. It didn't care who you were and what you own. You know, it's about respect. It's about aloha, respect for the aina, respect for the kai, respect for the Hawaiian culture. That's what it was all about. So much good times there. To relax on the beach or relax at night. No police there. It was a beautiful thing. You know, I seen photos. I seen some web video online and stuff. Just seeing that, you know, it just... For a lot of families and for myself, it's traumatizing, you know. Um, it's disturbing. You know, when my brother came to visit us, um, we decided to go down to Pohoiki and to see what happened there. And it was like somebody died. It's like a good friend died. And still right now, it feels that way and I'm trying to get over it. It's a deep sadness. It's kind of like if you watch Planet of the Apes and you see at the ending of one of the Planet of the Apes movies, you see the Statue of Liberty and you see the, and then you realize that's New York. That's what it was. That, that's kind of how it was for me. When I seen the break wall and you see the beacon that's there, you know, that's like our little lighthouse kind of thing. You realize where you're at and where things used to be. And then your mind is just like, it plays tricks on you because you're kind of thinking like what was there and is no longer there. And for me, it's kind of hard to think about that shacks and bows, all that is gone. You know, and where I stand, you could see all that. But now there's just land of lava and all that is no more. It's covered. I look at Uncle Holly's house. You know, that's a sad thing too. You know, everything's changing, you know. Um, his house has changed. You know, there's a pond in front of Uncle Holly's house and that pond is just... So much... Like, I can just look at it. Just so much bacteria in there. Like, I, I won't even step foot in that place. And then in front of Warren Pond... You know, Warren Pond is more... It was known already as bacteria. But at least at the ocean, somewhat... You know, cleaned it out. And now it's just loaded with bacteria. And who knows what. And people... You know, how much people go through that place. It's just a trip to really see the amount of change. I think that's what's affecting people. It's it's amount of change. And especially when Pohoiki was being reopened, I think that was, you know, for a lot of the locals, you know, for us, we want to try and help the place and get back to some sort of normalcy for the kids. I think that's the biggest thing is the children. You know, because for many of us, that was our childhood. Even when Pohiki was there, you know, the county was doing some weird things about, you know, because they knew that they wanted to try and make that place into a profit place, you know. And I feel the government is not even helping us to heal. And healing meaning, let the people do what they got to do to heal the place. It's not about tourism. It's about, not about making money. You're talking about kids. This is a time to shape them like how Pohiki has shaped all of us. 
maybe n- now maybe not be the surfing but you know we can do a whole lot of planting and i seen signs down there that you know the county is going so ridiculous to planting is not prohibited locking the gate why not let the people just drive on the beach you know have give them access so that they can just relax but they also need to know is that this place is not their disneyland it's not their playground to be tampering with because they already tampered with things and and we can see the outcome of what happened the lava flow took everything away you know poiki is not about a power trip and about boundaries and property who owns what you know poiki is a very special place last thing i just wanted to say is that i had a chance to just sit down on the beach and just watch the ocean and I heard my brother said, oh, the ocean is just angry. And the ocean is angry. I think the whole land there right now is angry. Angry at what's happening now. You know, our people are not able to do the things that we need to do in order to recover. You know, there was, you know, there's so much what we call in Hawaiian kaumaha, sadness. Day by day, that lava flow heading towards the place that so many people loved and mixed reactions because you have to respect the Hawaiian culture, the Hawaiian beliefs, and and you already know what goes along with that. And you really want to hang on to something that you truly love. So it's very difficult to explain this because culturally it's cleaning out everything, all the heva that what's going to happen there. But there's also more heva because of what the government is doing to our people. Of locking us out. And saying, no, well, we're going to do it the way we're going to do it. That's not what Poiki is about. And if that continues on, that whole place is going to be wiped out. Our Hawaiian people are not able to be Hawaiian. And be who we are. Replant to restore that place because right now that place needs a lot of malama by all of us the whole community needs to malama that place but it's up to us to decide how we're going to create it Poigi is still there and I think we got to make the best use of what we have and make new memories of that place but Poigi is like us many Hawaiians, we're free. And we're going to continue to be free.